Uh, all right, uh, I am very pleased to welcome Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz and Dina Gilio Whitaker to speak with us about their uh, fascinating book, All the Real Indians Died Off and 20 Other Myths About Native Americans. Uh, Dr. Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz is Professor Emerita of Ethnic Studies at California State University Hayward. She holds a doctorate in history from UCLA, as well as a master's in creative writing and international human, uh, human rights law. She grew up in Oklahoma and her mother's family is part Indian. Her first book, The Great Sioux Nation, was published in 1977 and it was the foundational text for the first ever international conference on indigenous peoples of the Americas that was held by the United Nations in Geneva. Um, Dr. Dunbar Ortiz has also studied and participated in the women's liberation movement and she was a frequent visitor to Nicaragua in the 1980s during the Contra War writing about the devastating effects of that conflict on indigenous Miskitu communities there. She uh, won the 2015 American Book Award for an indigenous people's history of the United States. That book chronicled the history of territorial dispossession, cult cultural disparagement, and outright genocide experienced by native peoples in the territorial US since the first arrivals of Europeans some 400 years ago. Dina Gilio Whitaker is an award-winning journalist, writer, and research associate at the Center for World Indigenous Studies. She earned a bachelor's degree in Native American Studies and a master's degree in American Studies from the University of New Mexico. Uh, Dina is a member of the Sinaiist Band of the Colville Confederated Tribes, Colville Confederated Tribes in Washington State. She is a frequent contributor to the Indian Country Today Media Network and to Native Peoples Magazine where she focuses on issues related to indigenous nationalism, self-determination, and environmental justice. In this book, uh, the authors discuss and deconstruct 21 myths about Native Americans and their history that persist in our society today, and the ways in which these myths contribute to the structural violence against Native communities that exists now, just as it has, sadly, throughout American history. It is a wonderful, concise primer all the more relevant as we head towards year one of a Trump administration that has promised to open up federal and tribal lands to unfettered resource extraction. And especially now when the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe is fighting to prevent its lands and water sources from being contaminated by the Dakota oil pipeline. Writing for Salon.com, Mark Treka says, this book is, quote, more than just a survey of the litany of atrocities that have largely gone, uncount gone uncounted in the American mythology. It is also a move towards understanding why these atrocities have gone uncounted, why that mythology is what it is, and it is an acknowledgement that history includes the present. On behalf of Politics and Prose, I'm honored to welcome Dina Gilio Whitaker and Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz to speak with us here at Busboys and Poets. Uh, thank you both so very much. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm so glad to be back here. I was here about a year and a half ago with the uh, previous book, and uh, it's just my favorite place, you know, to be. And I have some dear friends and relatives in the audience, and I am just just wonderful news that we just received this afternoon. <laughs> yeah. And, and you have to read that letter from the Army Corps of Engineers because it is really something. It refers to the Great Sioux Nation. That's the treaty title of 1868, and the government never uses that term. It's just incredible. It's like that used to be the whole territory, North and South Dakota, Wyoming, uh, most of Nebraska was the Great Sioux Nation. Now it's these little bitty islands. Um, so. It's, it is really a good way to start this difficult times that we're in, so we're really happy to be a part of that. So, um, yeah, the, um, all the real Indians died off, and 20 other myths about Native Americans, is a part of a, a series uh, from Beacon Press, my publisher of, of the other book. Beacon Press is... Uh, owned by the Unitarian Universalist Church. Any Unitarians here? We, thank you, we always thank the Unitarians for 
supporting that great uh, publishing company. And um, we are also a part of a series. The previous books are by Abe uh, Chomsky, uh, Noam Chomsky's daughter, and it's on immigration. The name of it is They're Bankrupting Us and 20 Other Myths About Immigration. And no, they're taking our jobs. And the other one is, is uh, Bill Fletcher Jr.'s um, They're Bankrupting Us, 21 Myths About um, Trade Unions. So we're proud to be a part of that series as well. And um, tonight we're going to, um, uh, Dina is going to read a pretty short chapter. These, the book is organized in these 21 chapters, 21 myths, uh, and each are like six to 10 pages long. So it's very useful for teachers. If there's any, are any teachers here, you don't have to read it all the way through. You can, you know, pick out and read one, then the other. And um, we try to tell a complete story in each one. So I think you'll find it very engaging and very useful to give to friends. To They want to know, well, what's all this about Indians? Just give them this book. Say, well, read this. And, and then uh, we'll talk. <laughs> so, um, so Dina will read from the chapter. And then uh, we'll open for discussion and uh, Q&A. Thanks so much again for coming. Before I begin, I want to just acknowledge, as uh, Native uh, people do, we acknowledge the, the original people of the land who we now are occupying. And I'm not that good with my geography. I'm going to say, and please correct me if I'm wrong, it's the Piscataway people? Yeah. Thank you. So I want to acknowledge and honor those people. Um, as we, as we do. So I'm going to go ahead and just um, read from this chapter. We, because we are in Washington, D.C., we have, um, well, no, let me back up. We have two chapters in this book that deal with the concept of native appropriation, cultural appropriation. Um, it's such a big um, issue in Indian country and uh, in native studies and, and by the way, just to let you know, this book is based uh, in sound um, scholarship from Native Studies and other disciplines that feed into it. So it's um, got a good academic base to it. But um, so this concept of cultural appropriation plays out in so many different ways. And um, that's why it needed two chapters. One of the chapters we have is called Sports Mascots Honor Native Americans. And you can probably guess why we cho chose this um, chapter to read here. So um, I'm gonna just go ahead and um, we'll, we'll go through it. At an Atlanta Braves baseball game, 50,000 fans are whipped into a frenzy, many of them dressed in Halloween costume style feathered headbands, their faces unselfconsciously painted in war paint doing the tomahawk chop to a cont contrived Indian drumbeat. The same thing happens at Kansas City Chiefs football games. The Cleveland Indians flaunt Chief Wahoo, a cartoon Indian that was likened to a red sambo by Cleveland Councilman Zach Reed. In Dallas, a gay pride parade annually features a float called Caliente with a banner that reads honoring Native Americans. The float and accompanying marchers are dressed in all manner of Halloween-style Indian garb, and the float is a mishmash of pseudo-Indian symbols ranging from totem poles to a life-size paper mache buffalo. At music festivals like Coachella, Sasquatch, and Bamboozle, where fashion matters as much as music, native headdresses have become all the rage. These are only a handful of countless examples of Native American cultural appropriation that can be named, a phenomenon that is so complex and persistent that the topic has filled volumes. Because of the vast scope of the issue, we devote the next two chapters to the most egregious and common aspects of it. Sociologist James O. Young writes that the cultural appro 
that cultural appropriation happens when people from outside a particular culture take elements of another culture in a way that is objectionable to that group. According to Young's definition, it is the objection that constitutes appropriation as distinguished from cultural borrowing or exchange where there is no moral baggage attached. Native American cultural appropriation can be thought of as a broad range of behaviors carried out by non-natives that mimic native cultures. Typically, they are based on deeply held stereotypes with no basis at all in um, knowledge of real native cultures. This acting out of stereotypes is commonly referred to as playing Indian. And as Philip Deloria's research so eloquently revealed, it has a long history going back at least as far back as the Boston Tea Party. Some forms of appropriation have been outlawed, as is the case with the Indian Arts and Crafts Act of 1990. Responding to the proliferation of faux Indian art, which undermines economic opportunities for actual Native American artists, the IACA is a truth in advertising law that regulates what can be legitimately sold as Indian art. No such possibility exists, however, for the vast majority of appropriations American Indians endure daily. Non-Native people play Indian whenever they don any garb that attempts to replicate Native culture, however serious or trivial their intent, or otherwise mimic what they imagine to be Indian behavior, such as the tomahawk chop, a fake Indian dance, or bogus war hoop. Native American appropriation is so ubiquitous in the U.S. society that it is completely normalized, not only rendering it invisible when it occurs, but also adding insult to injury. Native people are also shamed for being hypersensitive when they protest. Halloween costumes, popular fashion, and children's clubs and activities, such as the YMCA's princess, uh, Indian Guides and Princesses programs, and other summer camps are some of the more obvious ways cultural appropriation occurs through Indian play in mainstream society. But perhaps its most visible form is in school and sports team mascots. Campaigns to put an end to the turning of American Indians into mascots began in the early 1960s when the National Indian Youth Council began a organizing on college campuses to remove Indian uh, sports stereotypes. Then in 1968, the National Congress of American Indians, the largest pan-native representational and advocacy organization in the United States, established its own anti-mascot initiative. Once obscure, the movement to eradicate Indian mascots has snowballed into mainstream awareness. In 2013, the NCAI issued a um, a report outlining their position on Indian mascots. It mentions numerous resolutions that have been passed by the organization over the years, including one in 1993 imploring the Washington professional football team, referred to as the Redskins, to drop its name, and another in 2005 supporting the National Collegiate um, Athletic Association, the NCAA, ban on native mascots, nicknames, and imagery. The report summarizes the negative impacts that native mascots have been shown to have on native youth, citing, for example, a study by cultural and social psychology scholar Stephanie Freiberg. Her 2004 study revealed that when exposed to stereotypical Indian images, the self-esteem of native youths is harmed, eroding their self-confidence and damaging their sense of identity. This is crucial given that the suicide rate among young American Indians is epidemic at 18%, more than twice the rate of non-Hispanic white youth, and contextualized by the fact that Native Americans experience the highest rates of violent crimes at the hands of people from another race. Since the early 1970s, thousands of public and post-secondary schools have dropped their Indian mascots and hundreds more professional and governmental institutions have adopted resolutions and policies opposing the use of native imagery and names, including the American Psychological Association, the American Sociological Association, 
the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, and the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. In 2015, California became the first state to ban redskins as a mascot name in public schools. As the NCAI report indicates, the redskins name is particularly offensive to native peoples. Um, the redskins name is particularly offensive. According to the report, and this is a, um, a long quote, the term originates from a time when native people were actively hunted and killed for bounties and their skins were used as proof of Indian kill. Bounties were issued by European companies, colonies, and some states, most notably California. By the turn of the 20th century, it had evolved to become a term meant to disparage and denote inferiority and savagery in American culture. By 1932, the word had been a term of commodification and the commentary on the color of a body part. It was not, the, um, it was not then and is not now an honorific. The term has since evolved to take on further derogatory meanings. Specifically in the 20th century, it became a widely used derogatory term to negatively characterize native characters in the media and popular culture, such as films and on television. Over the past 20 years, at least 28 high schools have, have abandoned the name, but the Washington football team's owner, Dan Snyder, has stalwartly insisted that he will never change the name despite mounting legal challenges to its trademark and public outspokenness by President Barack Obama and other political leaders about its offensiveness. A growing number of media outlets and prominent sports reporters have vowed to stop using the name, and even NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell has acknowledged its insensitivity. Although arguments to justify the usage of native images in the world of professional sports are weak at best, there are some instances where the use of native mascots has been de deemed accessible at the college level, according to the NCAI report. The NCAA ban, for instance, includes a namesake exception that allows universities to keep their Native American nicknames and logos when they are based on a specific tribe and when they have been granted permission by that tribe. Such permission was granted for Florida State University, which is the Seminoles, Central Michigan University, which is the Chippewas, and the University of Utah, which is the Utes. The University of North Dakota, on the other hand, due to the oppositional, uh, due to opposition of the name Fighting Sioux from local tribes was not granted an, accept, an exemption. At the high school level, at least one high school in New York State has successfully fought to retain its native mascot despite a request from the state's education commissioner to boards of education and school superintendents to end the use of American Indian mascots and team names. Salamanca Central High School is located within the boundaries of the Seneca Nation. 26% of its student body is American Indian, and the team name Warriors is represented by an accurate depiction of a Seneca Sachem rather than the cartoonish plain style Indian so typical of native mascots. A name change was opposed by the Seneca Nation of Indians Tribal Council and the high school administration and student body, the Salamanca School Board and the Salamanca City Council in a show of cross-cultural sol solidarity. Native cultural appropriation via fashion is nothing new. It has been around at least since the counterculture of the 1960s and 70s. Pop icon Cher did her part when she appeared on national television dripping with silver and turquoise Navajo jewelry and singing about Cherokee half-breeds. The same was true for an entire generation of alienated middle-class white youth who adorned in beads and feathers were moving into teepees on hippie communes. Things got so convoluted that when Sashin Littlefeather went in front of the country 
to reject an Academy Award on behalf of Marlon Brando in 1973, dressed in full traditional regalia, she was accused of not being a real Indian and of renting her dress. So when a new generation began parading around in native war bonnets and other Indian-inspired um, attire at music festivals and on fashion runways and magazine covers, it was simply business as usual. Only there was a new generation of American Indians and their allies who were well-informed, mobilized, and unwilling to sit idly by and take it without vociferous criticism and even lawsuits. Designer Paul Frank, for example, drew outrage from the Native American community in 2012 when he threw a high-profile, star-studded, Indian-themed bash called Dream Catchin' Powwow, complete with plastic tomahawks, bows and arrows, war paint, and feathers. Getting the message loud and clear, the company issued an apology and announced a series of positive steps that included plans for a new collection by Native American designers with proceeds to be donated to Native, Native organization. That same year, the Navajo Nation filed a lawsuit, which it eventually won, against Urban Outfitters for trademark violations after the company used the word Navajo for underwear and flasks. And in 2014, as if completely oblivious to what was happening in the fashion world, hip-hop artist and fashion designer Farrell Williams appeared on the cover of, um, of LUK magazine in a costume version of a plain style feather headdress for which he later apologized. Even some mainstream US Americans understood the transgression when Time magazine published an online opinion piece spelling out just why the image was so odious pointing out that, the, that clothing designers are notorious for borrowing from other cultures for inspiration and uh, comparing fashion to cultural fusion in cooking, the author wrote, the link between clothing and personal identity, however, means that putting on another's, another culture's clothes is a greater claim to ownership and belonging than sampling sushi or buying a burrito for lunch. As long as nudity isn't a socially accepted option, we are what we wear, and our desire to define ourselves through borrowed finery can either entrench, uh, can either enrich or impoverish the so source community. Among other things, it is this subtle claim to ownership that scholars of cultural appropriation unmask, especially in the realm of mascot names and images. With university and college examples like the Florida State Seminoles, the University of Illinois Fighting Illini, Illini and many others, non-native mascot defenders claim such representations honor particular tribal nations and peoples, but what they really do is assert an imagined indigeneity whereby white dominant society assumes control of the meaning of nativeness. Professor um, of Professional Sports Team Management at Drexel University, Ellen Starowski, characterizes these kinds of fraudulent claims to Indianness as a system of sustained, sustainable racism within a socio-political power structure that renders Indianness tolerable to whites as long it is, as it is represented on terms acceptable to them. She also points out that the uh, points out the inconsistency of tolerating objectionable university Indian mascots with the central mission of higher education. The myth that Indian mascots honor Native Americans then appears to be little more than a carefully constructed rationale to justify the maintenance of a system of domination and control, whether intentionally or intentionally, unintentionally where white supremacy is safeguarded, what um, Robert Burkhofer Jr. famously called the white man's Indian. And particularly at the level of, sports, uh, of professional sports, the branding of Native American team names and images also serves more as a rationale to maintain financial empires explaining the stubborn adherence to racist portrayals of Native peoples and organizations like the Washington Redskins 
um, than dubious claims to be honoring them. But the justification for American Indian cultural appropriation don't end with sports team mascots battles and fashion debacles. Appropriating Native cultures by playing Indian permeates US society so broadly it strikes at the very heart of Native American cultures, their spirituality, or their spiritually based systems of belonging and identity, which we turn to next. And so that ends that chapter. And then the, the following chapter um, is called Native American Culture Belongs to All Americans. And we break that down, so. Yes, so um, I would add that um, these sports uh, mascots and you know the use of names of kind of made-up names like for vehicles, for military equipment, for a lot of the special operations that take place are named and. You, if you remember that uh, Bin Laden, the code name was Geronimo. Did everyone know that when it happened? Geronimo. Yeah. And this is and when they, uh, you know, when the um, paratroopers jump out of the airplanes, they yell Geronimo. So it's you know it's permeated in in the military and in the business world, you know, selling things. Uh, there was even a crazy horse beer for a while. I think actually they, the Sioux actually sued the company and they withdrew the name. So it, it's, I call it a fetish. You know, if you follow psychoanalysis, that means it's, it's really twisted. It's much deeper than just um, jokey or making fun of. But it's also, it's, a, it's an erasure. It's a part of the you know, erasure of Native people as, as human beings and uh, working societies. So I hope all of you are, will get involved if you're not already involved in trying to get the Washington team to change its name. Uh, if, even if you're not a football fan, but especially if you are, um, to, and also for teachers to teach that this is, this is actually honoring a bloody corpse, a murdered person, a dead Indian. That's what red skin is, you know. It's not, there's not only nothing honorable about it, it's, it's grotesque. So the others like, you know, warrior and, and uh, chief and Indians and all that, the, these also, they, you know, they have to go so anyway, I think we'll just open up for um, discussion and um, want to hear from all of you. And you know, we can talk a lot, but I'd rather do it in dialogue. Uh, <clears throat> great. Well, uh, y'all can just raise your hands, and I'll come by and try to get everybody. So. Um, when I was when I was growing up in the fifties. The entertainment world portrayed Native Americans, cowboys versus Indians. You can imagine how that was presented. Can you put it a little closer? Yeah, when I was growing up in the 50, 1950s, um, we were exposed to all the cowboys and Indian programs, not only on TV, but in the, uh, in the movie theaters. And you know who won and who lost, who was good, who was bad. Uh, there were even characterizations on some of the uh, TV shows just for kids. Howdy Doody had Princess, Summer, Fall, Winter, Spring. So today, how would you uh, summarize how entertainment, Hollywood, et cetera, has treated Native Americans? How, t how today? Um, I, I mean, I think that there is an improvement. Uh, you know, I would argue that there's, you know, definitely been an improvement, but there's still, um, problems with with the casting of um, of actors. You still have people playing native parts that are non-native people. You have Johnny Depp playing in that horrible, you know, Tonto film, right? Um, Rooney Mara played Tiger Lily in Pan. 
Um, and there, there are other examples. So while, while, I mean, I think they're, you know, trying to improve their representations, um, there are still problems. You know, more, most recently, and this is a little different, but not that different, we have that Disney film, Moana, right? And Moana does the same thing that it's done that, that the Hollywood industry and Disney, especially, Disney's one of the worst offenders of perpetuating harmful stereotypes. And even though, I just wrote a major article about, about this Moana thing, so I'm like, it's kind of like uh, uh, real present for me. Um, but in that particular instance, what, it, what Disney has done, they've really gone out of their way to make themselves look like they've become culturally competent. They did all this research, they've put it all out there about how, you know, they really brought in all these native um, Pacific Islanders to, to give authenticity to a story that is historically, that it, it's based on historical knowledge. But what they've done is they've completely homogenized all the cultures of what they call Oceania. They don't even, you know, it's not even Polynesia, it's not Micronesia, it's not Melanesia. They've blended them all together. And, and that in itself is, is um, a form of erasure, the un inability to, or the, the blending them all together, it's like pan-Indian. Pan you know, it's a, that's something that, that Hollywood still does. It still makes representations like the, the Plains Indian stands in for all Indians. And so that itself is a you know, subtle form of erasure. So the Hollywood's got a long way to go, I think. Hi, thank you for reading. Um, I'm a teacher here in DC and I frequently and, and teach native history in, to eighth graders. Um, and at the beginning of the year when we're learning about native peoples um, and the, the conquest of North America, I hopefully, or I attempt to, um, make sure students understand the derogatory nature of the Washington football team. Um, but I oftentimes struggle as a public educator because we are told to come off as neutral or that we are supposed to take a middle ground and present both sides and that this is a public debate on the name Redskin. Um, obviously, I believe it's wrong and I think that there is a moral truth here that this is something that needs to be changed. But I oftentimes get pushback from students and even parents um, for only showing one side. So if I don't also quote Dan Snyder, I come off as impartial. And so I'm just wondering how you think the best way to navigate that is in something that is seen publicly and by a diverse community as potentially two-sided, when in fact, historically, we know what the right answer is. That's, that's really um, a good question and a good example. It permeates everything in academia as well, my field in history. Uh, supposedly there's always two sides and it's always set up that way, you know, as a, a, you get one side and the other, like a debate forum or something. And um, actually there aren't two sides to a whole lot of things. There's no two sides to Nazism and, and the Holocaust, are there? I mean, there are these crazy people who deny it but there are no two sides. You know, who's gonna give the Nazi side of that story? Uh, so I think if you put it in those terms, you know, that we should in fact be doing what they do in German schools and teaching about the genocide of, of Native Americans and the genocide, inherent genocide in uh, enslavement of Africans. And um, having children learn that, just like, German children learn about the Holocaust and what their ancestors did, that they take responsibility for it, that it not happen again. So I, I think you have to have a lot of arguments. You know, it's a way of shutting things down. And in my field, in history, it's particularly pernicious because that's what filters down into the, uh, you know, whatever uh, his, history production 
then filters down into textbooks that go into schools and then uh, get adopted as mandatory textbooks. And this, this, this perpetuates um, stereotypes and lies. There, there are two things that happen with um, Native peoples. One is, is the uh, distortion, you know, complete distortion. They're savage and warlike, you know, our, like all, all our myths in this book. Um, they were always killing each other, so why does it matter if Europeans came, kill them? Uh, and then there's the absence, where whole parts of history, there are just no native people there. Um, that's what I asked Howard uh, Zinn always about uh, the people's history of the United States, is, you know, he's very good on, on the ge initial genocide, and then, you know, leading up to the Trail of Tears and he, it, it, was a, it was a really radical book, you know, in 1980. But after 1890, the Wounded Knee Massacre, there are no more Indians until Alcatraz. So I said, what were, you know, what was happening? Did they go into remission or, you know, <laughs> disappear and then reappear? And he would say, well, you know, you have to write that book. And I realized that he really didn't know how to deal with Native people other than as historical subjects, as no longer existing really, um, or then to fit into the, you know, the template of social movements, but not about sovereignty, not about land base, not about, you know, living cultures. Um, so I think there's a lack of capacity to do that, but now there are all these great Native scholars who you know, a, a couple of generations now, and they're just amazing, and a couple of them are in the room here <laughs> right now. Um, and they, um, they, they have to deal with this, that they're being, they're not impartial. You know, they, they are, that it's a, a advocacy, and they're dismissed. Only the white male can be impartial, right? Doesn't have a, any skin in the game, right? And that's because he owns everything, <laughs> you know, he owns the whole narrative. And so he's neutral on it. You have to then somehow fit into that or respond to it. You can't go around it and say, here's a different narrative, completely different narrative, because you won't get a PhD, you won't get books published, you won't get peer reviews, you won't get tenure. So that's, that's really the, the situation, and it has to... Um, uh, it's, it's, it's so admirable of a lot of the young scholars of color uh, and uh, who, who simply, well, what we did was, you know, set up ethnic studies, Native American studies, African American studies, uh, Chicano studies, and, and they were very marginalized and opposed, but they, and they hardly exist east of the Mississippi. You know, it's a, by the way, there's a, a movement at Harvard among uh, history uh, among graduate students in American studies to develop an ethnic studies department. And there's a petition online, and I hope you will go and sign it. It's not just for people associated with Harvard. Um, I. You know, I'm part of what you're talking about in terms of where were they. Uh, I'm part Iroquois, but in my family, we would not acknowledge it. And when I tried to bring it up as a child, uh, I was told, don't talk about the squaw. And so I have to say that your book was my awakening and my justification. I used to teach in a graduate program. I never talked about this because just what you're saying. And I just want to say that thank you for opening this up. And I wish that we could allow every person that was living in my state of denial a copy of, of your book and this book too. I, I just, I mean, I just have to say thank you for that whole cadre of, of people that were denied the right to say who they were.
I have to also thank you, Joanne. When I interviewed you when that first book came out, you would be surprised at the, the feedback that we got. Thank you for telling the truth. Now, talking about the Washington football team, when I, a year after I first went on the air, I think 14, 15 years ago, I had three Native American chiefs on my show and also a medicine man. And in the conversation, the name of the Washington football team came up. And uh, the medicine man said, we need to do something about this now. So I said, what would you like to do? He said, let's put a curse on that team. <laughs> so we did, we did a ceremonial prayer and, and all of that. And ever since that happened, Washington football team has not won anything. <laughs> no championships or anything. And uh, I'm looking for a call from Dan Snyder any day. <laughs> but thank you both so much for doing what you did. Just wanted to add a few words of thanks as well. Just uh, uh, reference was made to the multiple generations here. And the thing that breaks my heart as a dad uh, is that uh, when native kids are in schools, um, kind of you know, predominantly non-native, uh, they're expected to be spokespeople of their entire, you know, entire community, the entire native community. And it's works such as yours that allow parents to you know, uh, patiently explain um, things like why having native costumes on Colonial Day um, probably isn't a good idea. And so that's the armor that uh, families need, you know, to, to kind of um, fight these quiet fights at home with their schools in respective ways. And having uh, the scholarly work out there provides that ammunition. And so I just wanted to uh, give a heartfelt thanks as, as a father. Mado. I also wanted to start with a thank you. Uh, though I hadn't met you before and appreciate the reading you provided and the context you provided, I've followed Roxanne, some of her history, as a great freedom fighter for women's rights, civil rights, anti-war, as well as for native rights. And I admire you and was so glad to hear you speak in, in person now. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask a question that may be a little farther ranging from the book, so this may be appropriate or not, but we are meeting at a moment in which perhaps the most racist, but culturally insensitive, uh, but much more than that, administration is about to come to power. Not just Trump, but peopled up and down uh, with the administration, one announcement being to me, more frightening than the one before. Do you have advice in both your history as a freedom fighter and in knowing what the historical background really is for either of you, any advice for a perspective that allows us to move through this period and end it? Uh, I, um, you know, when I, I, I did an indigenous people's history of the United States two years ago, uh, that book came out and I worked on it for seven years, I, trying to, but it's kind of a culmination of what, be, uh, being a person of the left and, you know, proudly a person of the left, uh, and I invoked my grandfather, who was a wobbly and in the Socialist Party in Oklahoma uh, back in the day, and named my father Moyer Haywood Scarberry Pettibone Dunbar, 
that's the names of the founders of the IWW. So I, I, um, uh, I'm proud to be on the left, but I get so frustrated because ever since I can remember, you know, when I was first at San Francisco State in uh, 1960 on, it's the it's just the absence of native people on the left, you know, a, a lack of interest. It, on the right, it's clear, they, they want Indians dead. You know, they want the land base uh, and all the uh, um, federal lands to be privatized. Uh, they have no, you know, no compunction about it. But on the left, um, there's a really, you know, I was, I was thinking about Thanksgiving how it got created during the New Deal, during the Depression. And I really think, I haven't found the documentation yet, because you know Thanksgiving was just prayer day for pro Protestants, for Puritans, and they usually fasted. So Thanksgiving is a completely manufactured. Uh, George Washington announced it, had nothing to do with pilgrims and, and Indians. And Mayflower, nothing like that. It was just prayer, uh, Thanksgiving. And then Lincoln did it during the Civil War. Again, no, you know, so that holiday wasn't set up to have anything to do with Puritans, uh, with uh, pilgrims and Indians. So come the, the, um, the period of the New Deal, and there's this John Collier, you know, who, who does care about Native people, lived at Taos, and he got appointed uh, secretary of, uh, you know, in charge of uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs. And so I think there was some sympathy generated, you know, some knowledge, ah, they're still here. You know, there was, even though they went and shot all the Navajo sheep, uh, you know, the, the, it wasn't a deep sensitivity. But I think that's the only thing I can think of of why suddenly Thanksgiving was turned into this cartoon thing, you know, of pilgrims and Mayflower and the Indians. So the way they incorporated, and I'm saying, you know, Communist Party was in the lead of many of these things. I mean, including John Collier's affiliation. That that they thought, you know, in this way they could incorporate this idea of incorporating. That's just another way of erasing is incorporation. You know, integration. And and then in the civil rights movement, integration is the goal. You know, the the goal of well, except for black nationals, it's the goal of, um, of being equal in the society, not separate. So Native people don't fit in any of the left templates that have ever existed. And unless that changes, and I'll tell you why it's not just fairness, it's, it's for our survival because the U.S. military is based on its entire history. If you meet, read military textbooks, that's all they talk about are the Indian Wars. This whole military we have, this predatory military in the world, was formed by killing Indians. And that's how, that is the DNA. They consider, they actually have in their military annals, the Wounded Knee Massacre, they call it a battle. And in the column of win, loss, win. They gave 28 Congressional Medals of Honor for killing unarmed civilians, refugees, starving refugees in the middle of winter. If we don't begin to deal with the absolute evil of this country <laughs> and the military control that's there, and the left, the military is always kind of off the charts except the anti-imperialist people who also don't relate what's happening in the world to the very existence of the United States and its reason for being. So it's a matter of life or death, literally, for people around the world. And I think here too, you know, that, that we, we get this history straight and admit to it, stand up to it. And the, if the left's not gonna do that, who's gonna do that? You know, in the general population, who's gonna do that? So that's, you know, that's my rant. <laughs> well, I got my own mic here. <laughs> so, so my rant is that I think that the that we are in, in a, an unprecedented moment of history, and if there's any 
sign of hope or any positive thing that's come out of this insane election that we've just come through where we've elected a fascist regime. Okay, we got, we got a guy with, that we can honestly call fascist now. Okay, we can use that language. We've known for a long time that there are these fascist tendencies, a fascist, a, a, a racist undercurrent, you know, since the 1980s, the, since the 1970s really, this country has been in a state of backlash. We've been in a state of backlash to the civil rights era. So we had the civil rights era during the 60s, the 1970s, we had affirmative action, we had um, sort of a, uh, an integration of civil rights legislation, and we were going in a good direction away from um, segregation, away from these racist histories and policies that this country had built itself on. Well, by the 1980s, we start seeing that backlash coming in with, with the Reagan administration, with um, the, the Republican Party refashioning itself into uh, a party that appeals to the working class, to the poor, brilliantly convinces them that they represent them and that they work for them. And so uh, by the 90s, we have the Clintons. The Clintons are you know, the neoliberals. They skew the political landscape to the right. And then we have, Ob we have Obama. And Obama, you know, we, th we have the illusion that because we have a black president, racism is gone. We are in the post-racial society. But we know, especially people of color know, that that's not the case. But it's hard to, to pinpoint it and to claim that because we got this black president. Well now, so now we have this the Trump, we have these, these, uh, these so-called alt-right ideologues. We know that alt-right is white nationalism and white nationalism is just code for white supremacy. We know that. We can name that now. We can say we have got a bunch of white supremacists running the country, the people that, that Trump has surrounded himself with, his right-hand guy, this guy Steve Bannon, that guy's dangerous for people of color. But we can name it now. So it's, it's the line in the sand that's been drawn. That's how I see it. I see that the, this election, this, the campaign that he ran, this extremely um, uh, vitriolic campaign where everybody that's marginalized was attacked, people of color, disabled, um, LGBTQ, you know, all the most marginal, you know, uh, Muslim populations, everybody was a target and will be a target in a Trump administration. So um, I think it's incumbent on all of us to just say it and not apologize for it. Call them racist, call it out. We don't have to, we don't have to um, dance around it anymore. And I think it's really, um, it's our responsibility you to call it out where we, where we see it. It's time to, to um, not apologize and to not um, be afraid, you know, to not hurt people's feelings or be, you know, sensitive. It's like, you know, we're just, we're just in that time now and I, and I don't know, that's, that's my advice. <laughs> And uh, just one more thing, uh, apropos to, especially uh, Heather Booth here, by, by the way, is a very um, famous person that uh, we owe a lot to for women's rights today. She was one of the leading leaders of the women's liberation movement and in, in the Students for Democratic Society, the anti-war movement. And, you know, I, I noted that um, 62% of white women who voted, voted for Trump. And that shows the measure of our failure at women's liberation. You know, how, we, we now know kind of, we have a good almost statistical feel now of what we've done wrong or what we haven't done on the left in women's liberation or African-American, um, uh, what we haven't done, I think, is be bold enough to um, 
insists that feminism is an earned quality, not just having a vagina. You know, that it, it's a political, it's, it's a pop political that not everyone deserves it. Because we've allowed, you know, this kind of neoliberal thing. Well, everyone's a feminist. You know, you're a woman, you're a feminist. So, um, you know, so these right-wing Republican women can, you know, claim that they are for women's rights. And so I think we have to be very bold, you know, and say and challenge and not be so... Um, you know, I think the McCarthy period just had a devastating effect on, on, on uh, audacity, and it, the generation of the new left that that put that aside and said, you know, we're not going to deal with that, um, had a very rough time because COINTELPRO and the, you know, the, they got the same treatment that the left had gotten in the 50s and imprisonment, and it mostly fell on African Americans, Native Americans, and uh, Mexicans were the, but also many, many young, uh, uh, the young white people were, some of them are still in prison, and uh, Puerto Ricans, and, um, but I think that it's not just being, you know, uh, Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin, you know, being so out front, but being politically, you know, not trying to play tricks on people, but talk straight, you know, just talk clearly and say exactly what you mean instead of um, trying to manipulate people or um, uh, organize them, you know, to, to just really be bold. And, and if you, you know, if, if, uh, if they don't come back for more, you know, say, I want, I want to learn more about that, then let them go. You know, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, you're not just, you know, it's not a popularity contest, revolution. <laughs> uh, and this will be our last question, not because uh, this dialogue isn't fascinating and I wish we had more time, but we are running out, so um, afterwards there will be the signing. I'd like to thank you for your work, first of all. I had a women's organization, and obviously black women know how to vote in our best interest, as evidenced by this last election at 94%. <laughs> I have um, worked on women's rights, of course, because women's rights are human rights. And I've traveled to Minnesota. I've picketed that football team that you're talking about when they played in Minnesota. I've done it here in Washington. I have issues on my website, but why don't we know each other? Why aren't we working together on, on, on our, our issues? I mean, your issues should be my issues and mine should be yours and others in the room, but I don't know how to call any of you. I don't know about you now. Maybe that's my fault, but we need to share more. We need to form coalitions and care just as much about the issues of other human beings as we care about our own. Yeah. Hi, um, this is a little bit different. My biggest concern, I mean, we got so many issues, but my biggest concern is the environment. And I read a whole lot. And I'm aware that American Indians has a very great perspective on it and they can teach us a lot. And I'm wondering, I don't even know how to ask this question. Uh, is there something, a book, something, a person from the community, the American Indian community, that can somehow save us from ourselves? You know, I don't know how, to, how else to put it. But you know, we're going to heck. Yeah. And the only way we're gonna change things in my book is for us to change. And like I said, American Indians have so much to teach us. So I guess to start with, is there a book? Is there a website? Is there something? Um, I think there's 
a lot of information out there, but I, I think one of the things, there's, there's a danger, and, and one of the dangers is there, one of the stereotypes that, that we have is, is the Native American as the ultimate environmentalist. Okay, there's, um, there, and we don't have time to really talk about that, but I will say that the Standing Rock, the, the, the No Dapple movement, the Maniwi Choni message of um, what's happening at Standing Rock is, has brought that attention into, the ma into mainstream awareness, and I think that's why it's been so powerful. It galvanized everybody. That message, Maniwi Choni, Water is Life, was something that everybody could relate to because it, they, they made it clear that it wasn't just their water supply at Standing Rock that was jeopardized, it's the water supply of 18 million people downriver. And everybody knows that. Everybody knows water is life. And so, um, you know, I think that the, the brilliance of this movement is that it um, brought together the message of our jeopardized environment together with um, treaty rights and the history of treaty violations. So um, um, I'm hoping in my writing in the future to bring that together to, um, because there's, it's, a, it's a trend in, in um, higher education, some of the studies that are coming out now, these researchers are saying that the protection, and this is worldwide, not just here, the protection of indigenous rights is the protection of the environment. And so um, that's, that's the future. And by the way, uh, Dina's gonna write a book. Her next book is on uh, indigenous peoples and, and the environmental movement because there's a lot of uh, conflict in the past. We have Andrew Curley here who has studied that at the Navajo Nation. The, the environmentalists coming in from the outside and thinking they know best. They know nothing about the politics of the Navajo Nation. They don't know the people, but they're thinking of the environment and why aren't these people uh, doing this or that? Why, you know, why are they participating in the uranium mining or the coal mining, you know, and uh, expectations of then being disappointed, you know, disappointed in in Native people. Um, but the environmental movement is, you know, is, is at a turning point with this present movement because they're not in control for the first time. They're not just trotting out Native Americans to, you know, speak on their behalf as organizations raising money. They're under the leadership of a, a tribal government. If they're there, they have to accept that leadership. And this is the first time in United States history that a movement has had to, if they want to remain a credible movement, take Native leadership. That's extraordinary. And I think it changes everything, you know. So I think, I think now we have a window of opportunity to talk about climate change that did not exist six months ago, because of this. And that that's really amazing. Yeah.